Imagine, the world has been thrust into chaos. Nuclear wars have erupted. Millions of Christians have disappeared. We're on the verge of this. Let's talk about it. And here to talk about it is author and lecturer Bill Solace. Bill, you have a new book, and uh, we're going to be talking about it in this program. But you've also had some great insights into a sequence of events that's just ahead of us. Absolutely, Gary. And <clears throat> I want to talk about this book. It's called The Apocalypse Revelations. It's actually a novel. I, I've went away a little bit from my uh, nonfiction type writing and written a novel called The Apocalypse Revelation. You know, these Ancient prophecies are about to roll off their parchments and pound down on the pavement, packing a powerful global punch. And it's mm -hmm. been over two decades since the great best-selling uh, Left Behind series of Tim LaHaye and, and Jen uh, Jerry Jenkins was written. But there are new revelations into the apocalypse that have been discovered and need to be discussed, and that's exactly what we've done. I've thought, long, thought lard, long and hard <laughs> about that and, and put it into this book. How will these things lay out? Because it's one thing to talk about biblical prophecies across the table, and we've done that many times. Mm -hmm. But how will this actually affect a family as these prophecies lay out? And these prophecies are stage setting right now. They could actually happen to a modern family today. They could, yeah. So we run an American and an Israeli family through some of these prophecies between now all the way up to the tribulation period. And you know, Bill, we're seeing more clearly right now than we have, I think for the very simple reason that we're closer. And it's just an old truism that the closer you get to something, the more detail you can see. And that's exactly what's happening. Well, that's the goal, really, with any kind of biblical prophecy and discernment, is trying to sequence how is it going to logically play itself out. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we go back to uh, what some people joke around with the church fathers, right? Yeah. Al Lindsay and Tim LaHaye, they did great jobs and great works of their understanding of biblical prophecies, but they really... They didn't have these insights that we can talk about now that they were really laying out in a chronological timeline, like Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus, the nuclear showdown in Iran of Jeremiah chapter 49 dealing with Elam, and several other prophecies that they didn't necessarily incorporate into their teaching back at that time or in the Left Behind series. But we've done that in this Apocalypse, Apocalypse Revelations novel here. And who could have predicted things like uh, uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan of Turkey? And uh, Hafez al-Assad, uh, and, and all of the political chicanery that's going on between the Iranians and, and the Syrians. And, and Bill, this is all current events. Every day when you open uh, your computer up, uh, you, you see new details. Absolutely. Early on into the story of this family, we have the destruction of Damascus taking place mm -hmm. as it would, how would it lay out, how would it play out, and how would it affect right. an American family? And so we have Isaiah 17. Now, you know, it's interesting, Gary, you and I were talking about this before the show. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people when they teach on Isaiah 17, I don't want to say they sort of just seem like it's sort of, it'll come, Isaiah's uh, prophecy and Damascus will cease from being a city, it'll be reduced to rubble. That's sort of the end of the story. No, the story goes on in Isaiah 17 and several verses that follow. Actually looks like Israel gets hit hard when this happens, which is one of the reasons they have to take out a city, an Arab city, Damascus. It says, the glory of Jacob shall wane lean. It says the uppermost part of representing Israel will be like an olive tree with just a few olives remaining on the branches. My concern is when this starts to happen, Isaiah 17, you're going to have Hezbollah who's got about 150,000 missiles pointed at Israel, some of them precision-guided uh, warheads. You're going to have Syria drawn into this. Of course, Hamas will be brought in. These are all proxies of Iran. And how will Iran not be drawn into this type of thing? So this is going to be a situation where Israel could face estimates maybe 1,000 missiles, precision-guided, some with perhaps chemical weapons, coming into Israel, into Tel Aviv, into the strategic bank of targets. <laughs> Israel will not be able to withstand that. They won't be able to stop all that. And it will prompt Israel to go into a defensive mode that's been unprecedented, where they actually would take out a city. And Isaiah 17, 9 says that the desolation is caused by the children of Israel, regarding the desolation of Damascus. And in verse 14 of Isaiah 17, it says, At one night you see Damascus, but in the morning 
he is no more. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Yeah. And Israel possesses the weaponry to do that. But what would prompt Israel to do that, to take out a whole city? And it would be probably because of the type of war they're engaged with, with the multi-front attacks coming against them. And it's very, very helpful if you study prophecy to establish a kind of a, uh, a map, if you will, or a timeline, or maybe to put it another way, uh, a sensible view of what could happen given what we have in front of us today. Uh, we have uh, an American president who ha is uh, amazing in his relations with, uh, with Israel, for example, and we're, we're going to talk about that. We have an American president who doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, mind making a, a little tumult here and there. In fact, he loves to stir the pot, unlike I think any other president in my lifetime. And when he does, the, the uh, chiefs of state everywhere uh, get up on their haunches and say, okay, this keeps up, it's going to be war. And we've never been in a situation like this until just very recently. Right, and you know, speaking of our president, Donald Trump, um, he is preparing, as we sit here today, a mm -hmm. deal of the century, a Middle East peace plan. And uh, because we don't want to timestamp this program, but we don't have all those details just yet. We have some information that has come forward. But you talk about him being a, a very unique personality in the world scene right now. Well, a lot of people, especially in Israel, uh, dealing with the people wanting to build a temple, a lot of Christian Zionists, are comparing Donald Trump to King Cyrus. They've even put coins together with uh, superimposing Donald Trump's image over the great King Cyrus the Great. And is, is that comparison good? Is that how God sees that comparison? I mean, here's the situation. Let's look at Cyrus for a minute. Uh, go ahead and read. Are you, are you at Ezra? I am. Why don't you read Ezra 2 and 3? Because Cyrus is a very unique individual. He was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, yeah. over 100 years before he was on the scene. It's interesting that Ezra, you know, moving back into the, another temple era, uh, in chapter 1, the first year of Cyrus king of uh, Persia, chap uh, and, and then verse 2 of chapter 1, thus uh, saith Cyrus king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Uh, who is there among you? All of his people, of all his people, his God be uh, with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. So what a thing for a, for a Gentile leader to do. Absolutely. You know, so let's, let's look at that and make some comparisons today between Cyrus and Trump. Cyrus was prophesied about. And Cyrus, when he heard about the prophecies, he became a believer. He said, uh, the Lord God, He is God which is in Jerusalem. So he was clearly a believer and he took it upon himself to understand his prophetic calling which was to send the Jews back to Israel after their 70 years of captivity. Now let's compare that to Donald Trump. Let's see if God really compares Donald Trump to King Cyrus. And I hope he does, but I'm not, and I'm not, certainly not trying to come out against Donald Trump. I think he's a very interesting and important president at this point in time. But what's he prophesied about? Not necessarily, but let's not give that a, a bad mark. Um, is he a believer? Well, we hope so. Some people believe he is. We hope he is a believer. Cyrus was. But will he do what Cyrus did? And that is no God's will for the Middle East peace plan. And that's what we're talking about this deal of the century. He's presently talking about a Saudi reporter, uh, Saudi journalist, respected Saudi journalist, came out and said that the Trump peace plan will divide Jerusalem, the old city. The Palestinian and the uh, I think it was the Armenian quarters, the Christian quarters would go to the Palestinians, the mm -hmm. Armenian and the Jewish quarters would go to the Jews. I am not saying that's going to be part of his peace plan. That was a respected Saudi journalist. Um, he's, uh, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, peace envoy, was on interview on Sky TV out of the UK, and he talked about recently about eliminating the borders around Israel, you know, which would be very difficult for Israel to accept. So we have to see if those types of plans will come forward. But the reason I, I don't think that's going to work or that's part of God's plan is because God has a peace plan he set forward around 2,600 years ago in Jeremiah chapter 12, uh, Gary. And unless we compare that those details to what Trump's going to come out with, which I guarantee he won't come out with these details, then it's not going to be a successful plan. And again, we're, we're talking about a contemporary regathering of Israel. It's right in front of your eyes right now, should you care to watch. 
And uh, Jeremiah 12, 16 uh, says, and it shall be if they uh, learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name uh, as the Lord lives, uh, as they taught my people to swear uh, by Baal, and by the way, much of the world today is swearing by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people, but if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. So that really sets a contemporary state. Right, so what the verses just the preceding that, which are important, it says, Jeremiah 12 verses 14 and 15 leading into the 16 and 17, God had a peace plan. He said, thus says the Lord God against all my evil neighbors, referring to the neighborhood, calling them evil, not good neighbors. Those are the, the inner circle of countries around Israel that he's referring to. He says, uh, they touch the, ap- the inheritance which I have e- caused my people Israel to inherit. That would be the promised land. When he's addressing the promised land, the Jews coming back into the land. He says, I will pluck them out of their land, the Arabs out of the Jewish land, and it shall be that the house of Judah will pluck out from among them, because there were Jews in those Arab lands. You know, for 400 years, of course, during the Ottoman Empire, from 1517 to 1917, you had this scenario that is now going to change. He's going to resettle the land over there. And he did this after World War I. And he's gonna, he says, I'll bring them all back into their different lands. I'll have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage, everyone to his land. So we see God doing this. This is the plan that's already in place. It's about to find its final fulfillment. And, and you know, I'm going to just segue for a minute and say this. In April 1st of 2013, I was on Daystar TV with Marcus and Joni, and John Kerry was on his last month trying to put peace together with the Jews and the Palestinians. He had been negotiating for nine months from July of 2013. And Joni said to me, what would you tell John Kerry? It's the same thing I would tell Donald Trump, the same thing I just quoted right here. God had a peace plan together. He was going to resettle the area. He did this after the World War I. He got Egypt and the Arabs plucked them Egyptians back in in 1922. That was Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq, 1932. You see, he did this. Iran became 1935. That was formerly Persia. Lebanon, 1943. Syria and Jordan, 1946. Israel, 1948. So God had resettled the areas. He had plucked the Arabs out of the land. It was going to be Israel. Plucked the Jews out of the land. It was going to be now going to be the Arab states. And there's all the Arab states. And what you read is the critical response. And it says, It shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then it shall be established in the midst of my people. So in other words, be thankful, Arabs, for your states, because God reestablished those for you as per part of His plan. He plucked you out, put you back into the lands of your inheritance, and promised to have compassion on you if you will swear by Him, the Lord God of the Bible, as the Lord lives, as you taught with the same zeal the children around Jeremiah's yeah. time <clears throat> to swear to Baal, and they were sacrificing their children at that time to Baal, right? But he says to them, but if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. The destruction of nations who don't comply, and those Arabs are worshiping Allah. They're not worshiping the God of the Bible. They're not thankful for the God of the Bible for giving them their Arab states. And I believe this is truly what God's plan is. And I do not believe Donald Trump's aware of it. I do not believe he would implement it. And the utter destruction of nations is what we're talking about. And there's no shortage of biblical prophecies. I cover them in the Apocalypse Revelation as they would play out in a family's life of Arab states being destroyed by the Israeli Defense Force. And having said that, uh, the Apocalypse Revelations is is a novel. <clears throat> and I want you to talk about the novel uh, for a minute. But the novel has a scenario built into it. Now there are several ways you can talk about a scenario. Uh, you can say if this happens, if this happens, if this happens then this other thing is going to happen and the Bible says this and we've all gone through you know, dozens of prophetic scenarios. But we're getting close enough now that we can see that the rapture could happen and then very close after that a number of events could break loose. Uh, but who knows the sequence? Well what Bill has done here as is uh, fictionally present a plausible sequence of biblical events. Uh, easy to read, easy to, to, to ingest uh, all these complicated developments. And uh, I've read bits and pieces. I had, had, haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet, but you do a good job of putting your scenario in an understandable way. Yes, thank you. And we actually hired a professional novelist to help me with this novel so that we could make it. Because, you know, a lot of novels, when you read them, prophetic novels, 
they can be four or five or six hundred pages. Oh, yeah. And a lot of that, I hate to use the word, the kind of fluff. There's the story, the whole thing going on there, and the interactions, and that's important. But the meat section is maybe five or ten percent of the prophecies. So my tendency was 80, 90 percent meat and maybe 10 percent fluff. We had, to, we had to make it a little more novel-esque, so we hired a professional novelist writer. And we turned it into a really good story. And so when we talk about the rapture, we do have a, a chapter in here dealing with the rapture. Now, could that happen before all the prophecies we, we've been talking about? It could, because it's a signless event. There are no preconditions. However, I sequence it after a few prophecies that could happen in advance of that. Isaiah 17, the Jeremiah 49 prophecy with Elam, the Arab, the Israeli War of Psalm 83, the Israeli Defense Forces taking places to task. And then the rapture. That doesn't mean that's the order they'll happen, but I'll tell you what, Gary, if it happens in that order, you, dear viewers, are going to be experiencing some very powerful prophecies to find fulfillment mm -hmm. probably very soon. This whole thing with Damascus being destroyed could happen in the very near future. Well, at, as we speak, uh, there is a considerable dialogue going on between Israel and uh, the Syrians. And the, what's at stake is the Golan Heights. Now, Israel's been in the Golan Heights now for some time, and Syria is saying, no, you get out of the Golan Heights or there will be war. So they have presented a, an ultimatum. Well, we seem to be getting to a point right now where the next shot across the bow, bow could lead, lead to a major war and probably an epic biblical prophetic war. You know, recently you had uh, Bashar al-Assad go over to Tehran, and it, the, what we were told, but reported by Devka, for instance, is that he was escorted promptly to see Ayatollah Khomeini. And I think it was the first time he'd seen him during that Syrian revolution. Don't count my word on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. But he went there without his aides, and apparently with the outcome of that meeting was that we are tired of Israel striking Iranian targets in Syria. If this happens again, we expect you to retaliate on Israel. So that's a pretty powerful situation. Yeah. Now recently you had, has, uh, Israel has exposed that the Golan Heights now has got terrorist cells in there trying to establish a haven of terror right at the Golan Heights. So you know, we've got all these dynamics coming together at a point in time. And Israel has struck in 2018 about 200 times inside of Syria. A lot of those are on Iranian targets. So you know, this stuff is not, um, we're not fabricating this stuff. This is real-time application. And I have these kind of scenarios projected in this novel, which, by the way, the novel is a consolidation of the novels that were in the Revelation Road book mm -hmm. and the Apocalypse Revelations book. We put them together. Those books involved a novel and a commentary. We just put the two novels together so they can read together as one standalone novel. And the story is very impacting. Takes you through these wars, take you, takes you through the rapture of the church, and when you read that chapter, you're going to need some Kleenex because it's a very touching chapter mm. when the, the disappearances happen. Family gets left behind. We follow their saga as it goes through, as supernatural deceptions coming on. Ezekiel 38, the war is starting to settle, and this is an Israeli family now going through that. Uh, what happens there? How does that stage set? How does God stop that? What about the harlot world religion, Mystery Babylon coming onto the scene at that time after the rapture? So we get into all of this sort of things going on at that point. How does Israel become greater, safer? The Israel that's filled with plunder and booty, dwelling securely without walls, bars, or gates. We get into that also as we run this family through this Israel that's starting to burgeon and rushes. We see Gog's evil plan. We talk about that in the novel. How does he put together this coalition of Turkey and Iran and nine members all together to come and invade Israel, which by the way, Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas are not part of that. What happens to them in mm -hmm. advance? Yeah. We show what happens to them in this novel. And what's interesting here to me, Bill, is that uh, more and more now, and I think not just you, not just me, but a number of uh, prophetic uh, students uh, out there are beginning to say, you know, Certainly the rapture uh, is imminent. Nothing has to happen before the rapture occurs. But on the other hand, if it does occur, it's looking more and more like there's a, a, a good length of time between the rapture and the initiation of the seven years. And more and more we're having to look at what might happen during that unknown period of time, which could be a very long period of time. Could be 10 years, 11, 12 <coughs> years. 
And so more and more we're beginning to flesh this picture out in a way that we, we have never done before. Right. As things start to set up and we start to discern these insights, these right. prophetic insights, we start to realize that there is a gap after the rapture but before the tribulation. And that's not my new teaching that you've known there's a gap and, and many of our colleagues have talked about a gap. But we actually have to explore well, what goes into that gap. But we a actually, lot of people didn't want to look at it. That's right. They would say, oh yeah, there's a gap, but we don't know what happens there, so we're not going to talk about it. But you're talking about it. <laughs> well, yeah, because, so for instance, the rapture, I've got way back in chapter 18 or 19 of the book. Yeah. And I have a whole bunch of events, some of them we've been talking about that precede that. But what if the rapture happens in chapter 1 and these other events then follow? These are not tribulation events. And by the way, it's as you and I both know, it's not the rapture that starts the seven year tribulation period right. clock ticking. It is the confirmation of a false covenant that we have find in Daniel 9, chapter 20, verse 27, and Isaiah chapter 28, verses 15 and 18. That's what starts the tribulation period. So I think you're well founded in your thinking. We're starting to assess, hey, there's some time here. How, how much time could it be after the rapture for these things to happen? Like Ezekiel 38, that could very well happen after the rapture because that is dealing with Israel. Three times in Ezekiel 38 and 39 he mentions my people Israel, not my people the church. So that could actually be a major event after the rapture but before the tribulation because they're burning weapons for seven years in the mop-up of that battle when God stops it supernaturally. A lot of us are led to think, well that that probably means it happens before the tribulation because they could burn weapons for three and a half years before the seven year tribulation. They could burn weapons for three and a half years into the first half when they're living in that pseudo peace. But in the second half they're fleeing for their lives and not necessarily burn, burning the weapons. It's one of the arguments that many of us have as to why it's a pre-tribulation event. Now, having said that, that we were, we're sort of set up to begin in earnest now to, to talk about what's going to happen. Because uh, after all this setup, uh, there are a couple of cataclysmic things that have to happen. We haven't talked about Zechariah, we haven't talked about Ezekiel, we haven't talked about uh, any of the wars, Israel's victories in the wars and so forth and so on. But we do know that Israel's going to be victorious. And Nobody is going to expect it, just as they didn't uh, going back to nineteen uh, to the nineteen forties. Uh, the, the Jews were about to be knocked out altogether. Everybody said it's all over for them now, and then they started coming back to Israel. And before you know it, uh, nineteen forty-eight, forty-nine. Wow, they won a war mm -hmm. unexpectedly, <clears throat> and that same thing is going to replay, I think, in the future. Well, you know, the Israeli Defense Forces are in, exist today in fulfillment of biblical prophecies. Matter of fact, when it says in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 17, I will utterly pluck up and destroy those nations that are not in compliance with God's peace plan, he uses the Israeli Defense Forces as the tool for that. Mm -hmm. We're told in Ezekiel 37, 10, they will be an exceedingly great army. We're told in Obadiah 1, 18, that they will actually destroy the Palestinians, the descendants of Esau. We're told in Ezekiel 25, verse 14, the same thing affecting the Edomites as well as the Saudi Arabians. So right. they show up in various different places, even in Jordan in Jeremiah chapter 49, which is an interesting thing because Jordan is going to be defeated by Israel and they will release control of the Temple Mount. That will be the byproduct of that if they still have possession of it at that time. And that's another one we put through here that could happen very soon at the present time. Now all that's very complicated <clears throat> and let's face it, a lot of facts. You could be bored to death. But if it's put right before you in the form of a novel, it pulls you right along. And uh, it becomes a, an experience in which you share a part emotionally, which is how you really remember things. So the best way to remember something is to emotionally live it. And you will do that in the Apocalypse Revelations. Uh, we're uh, presenting this to you at, here at Prophecy Watchers for your gift of $20. Go to prophecywatchers.tv the online bookstore, scroll down to Bill Solace's name <clears throat> and you're going to see up the Apocalypse Revelations. And along with that, absolutely free as a bonus, we're, we're going to include Bill's earlier novel, Apocalypse Road. And uh, many of you may already have it. Here's your opportunity to just get it for free when you order for your gift of $20, Apocalypse Revelations. By the way, we always like to put things in packages. <laughs> and here is the package. Bill's previous works, which we have here, 
uh, at Prophecy Watchers for you. You can order any of them. But uh, we're offering a, a, an end times prophecy package. You'll find it in the online bookstore. Five books, five DVDs uh, for your gift of $100. Free shipping anywhere in the United States. Uh, again, that's prophecywatchers.tv. Go to the online bookstore. Just to review, the book, The Apocalypse Revelations, has a bonus, Apocalypse Road, which is absolutely free. Uh, yours for a gift of $20 or for $100, the whole thing, the whole Megillah. <laughs> you can find out about it in the uh, online bookstore right under Bill Solace's name. Now, we've got a few minutes, Bill, uh, to kind of round up. And we're not going to be able to say everything we need to say in today's program, so we'll have to do another one. But uh, where does this leave us at this point in time? Well, we're, we're on the cusp right now, I'd say right on the threshold of these ancient prophecies starting to unpack themselves and affect us. And unless Jesus comes to take us out as the very next prophecy, which it could be, folks, and we certainly uh, need to redeem the time because Jesus could come because we see all these things stage setting. But at the same token, you might start to experience things go cat cataclysmic from the Middle East that will definitely affect us not to mention the other things developing with North Korea and China and that sort of stuff that we've written about in this book, that will their story could become your story, like Gary had said. And you know, if these types of things start happening, how would you prepare for them? And that's what we try to do. This family's going through to them, they're responding to them, they're trying to prepare for them. And a, a couple of the characters in the in the story are very astute prophecy students and teachers. So they kind of see these things coming and they start making moves ahead of time and preparation, which is what we're alerting you to do. These things could start to happen and unravel real soon. How will you change? How will you affect, steward your lives accordingly? Hopefully the book will be a guide for that end. It's kind of a family context here. And I think it, we all think in terms of family, you know, if you, anything goes wrong, the first people you think about are your own family. What, am, right. what am I going to do? And that's sort of the setting here, right? Yeah, we have a, a grandparents are concerned their grandson has been birthed in the final tribulation ge generation, the terminal generation. They're trying to prepare him for the prophecies that are going to come for his generation. Uh, and, and as they start to happen, he's learning more of this young child. He's 12, 13 years old in the novel. He starts to learn about these things. And his unfortunately his sister doesn't know about, doesn't believe in Jesus. And his, his mother doesn't believe. And so they're trying to get them to understand. So many families are like that, Gary. They've got someone yes. inside the family who does not understand Jesus is the way, the truth, and the you life. You know, Bill, more and more families are like that as time goes on, and as we drift farther and farther away from the Lord, as prophesied by the apostles, they said in the last time, last days, perilous times shall come. And uh, you, uh, you know, think about your own, the, the, the people uh, around you, your closest uh, friends, relatives, and so forth who don't know the Lord, and that's the dilemma here. It really is, and that's the heart of the novel. In other words, we want this to be an evangelistic tool for those that are alive right now before the rapture, and also for those who are lost and left behind. At least they'll have a tool that they can read and go, wow, this is my story. We're going to have to continue this conversation. I'm Gary Stearman. Uh, join us again. And by the way, keep watching. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.